Hello, my name is Ruslan, or somebody may know me by the name Cake Eater. I am making this video to show you how I make games and to get some feedback from the mono game community. I will show you how I shaped mono game for my personal use. I am not a professional and I've learned everything by myself, and that means that it is possible that my style of writing code will be 100% different from yours. I don't know everything about C Sharp and I don't know everything about mono game, so I, so I highly encourage you to share your opinion about this project in the comments. Tell me how my engine is different from yours, what it has and what it's missing, what is comfortable to use and what is uncomfortable for you. Your feedback is really important to me. In this video I will only show you how to work with the engine and maybe sometime later I will make a video explaining how everything works under the hood. Also in the end I will show you the game that I'm working on that is built with this system. This engine is uh, inspired by action script or Flash. I spent a lot of time with it in the past and here I tried to replicate some of Flash's functionality in Monogame. There will be a link to the GitHub repo in the description of this video if you're interested in looking how the code works. And that's about it for the introduction and let's begin. So first of all let's create a new project. The engine is called Monocake and to start programming you just select this template and press OK. Here you can see some folders like game and engine and content. You click on the main and you write your entire project project here. Also, if you want to change how the engine works, you can just open this folder, open the class unit and just change whatever you want. I didn't export a binary library because I'm still tweaking the engine and it might be useful to just change something on the fly while you're making your game. And if you launch this example, you will get a very simple program. You will see a cake and it will follow your mouse on the screen because it's a cake engine. Now I'm gonna explain this code line by line. Let's comment everything out first. So first of all we create this object, this game object, the cake. If you launch the application now, nothing will happen. It's just a blank screen. If we set an image to the object like this, nothing will happen anyway. To display this object on the screen, you need to call the add render function. And now you can see the one big giant cake on the screen. The cake is too big, let's make it a little smaller. Every game object has a scale function. The scale function simply takes uh, this object and it squeezes or stretches it depending by the parameters. And if you launch it now, the cake is twice as, twice as small. Now about this update function. Every game object also has an add update method. This function is executed 60 times per second or 30 if you if you want to change how many times this function is executed, you just change some. You just go to the configuration and you change the FPS value to, to your liking. We will go. I will go over this class in a minute. Let's test the update function. I wrote a simple hello world in there and if we launch the program. Here you can see a hello world constantly being written in the console. And if we call cake.setxy to mouse, it will automatically move this object to the mouse position. But as you can see, uh, it's not centered because the origin point of this image is the top left corner. To change that, we can just call set center function and it will set the origin point at 50% of width and 50% of height. And as you can see, it is now centered. Let's remove that. Now let's go over most of the properties of the game object. Game object. Game object is like the main interactable class in this engine. Every single picture that you see on the screen is most likely a game object. If you see a player model, it is a game object. If you see a background that doesn't move or doesn't do anything, it is a game object. If you see a particle, it is a game object or not, but most likely it is a game object. Let's rename it. Let's call it GO, short for game object. And let's go over some basic properties. First of all, there is an X X property and a Y property. X and Y is obviously the position of the object on the screen. And you can also achieve the same result by writing game object dot set X Y x value y value. It is basically the same thing but one line shorter. Or if you want to set X Y to mouse, you can just write set X Y to mouse. 
It is very useful when you are doing some positioning on the screen and you don't want to re restart the application over and over again to tweak some coordinates. And you can just move the object on the fly to the position that you need it to be in. Let's remove that. We don't need that. Oh, I forgot I removed picture. Okay, then let's go over some image functions. We can game object dot set image and here you can pass a new texture to D or you can load a new image images slash x64. There is a content folder and it has images in it and here is an x and here is an x64. It's just a, it's just a 64 by 64 square and and you can add new images by double clicking this content and there is a simple interface where you can add and remove things. It is the default content pipeline given by Monogame and if you write this line of code you will uh, and after we set an image, we need to tell the engine that this object needs to be rendered on the screen. We just write add render, game object dot add render. And now it will be visible on the screen. Here is our 64 by 64 square positioned at 100, 100. To make sure that that it is at 100, 100, let's let's output, let's write everything about this game object to the console. We can just call game object to string, and it will give us a set of useful parameters like the name of the object, x and y position, width and height, the layer and the frame of animation, and the type of the class. Okay, moving on. Now the width and the height. You can set the width of the object by manipulating the w value. Let's make it this big. And here you can see we stretched the object a little bit. You can do the same with the height. You can also stretch it by the height. But it is not a good idea to manipulate these values. You are allowed to manipulate them, but that is not a good idea. Because these values will be reset when you set a new image, when you update the animation, it will reset the width and height. But there is still an option for you to change them if you want to, because sometimes it is very handy. So if you want to stretch the object without resetting its parameters, we can just go write this game object dot scale w oops scale w and by writing this and by writing this line we will stretch the object two times and here it is stretched two times bigger than it was you can do the same thing with the height and it is stretched by the height or if you don't the same situation with, with this you can just do it in one line you can write scale and because most of the times you don't need to to set different values to width and height. You can just write a single value in gameobject.scale and it gives the same result. Oh, and I forgot, if you if you want to set the name to the object, you just write gameobject.name and you write whatever you want here. Our where object. And as you can see, the name was updated. And if you don't set the name, the name will be just set to this. The next property of the game object is alpha. And if we manipulate this value, the object will become transparent. 0 0.5 is half transparent. 1 is completely visible. And as you can see, it's a little transparent. And there is also a way to make the game object completely invisible. There is a property is visible, and you can set it to true. And if you now launch the application, it will be visible because it's true. But if we set it to false, this time it will be invisible. And it's not all it's not only invisible, it's not even rendered. But if you change the value back to visible, the alpha value will stay the same. This doesn't manipulate the alpha at all. It only it only manipulates whether the object is rendered on the screen or not. So so the alpha is preserved. Now let's talk about origin points. Every game object has an OX and OY and OY parameters. This means that the origin point of this game object will be 1010. If we launch the application, you can see that. Oh no, you can see. So let's then do the same thing. Set XY to mouse. And this way you can see that the origin point of an object is shifted a little bit and we are moving it by this part of its corner. There is also a game object dot set center and you can write here the same the same thing 10 10 and it will be an equivalent to these two lines the same result or if you want 
this. There is another way to work with this function. There is also this single value. If you have a numpad on your keyboard, you can see the numbers 1 to 9, and you can see that number 5 is in the middle. If you set the parameter to 5, it means that the origin point of this object will be in the middle of the object. And here it is. Or you can set the origin point to be 9, which means the top right point of an object. And here it is. The other parameters of this function are double and double. This is what was shown in the example. You can say that the origin point is uh, like 10% of height and 10% of the width. And as you can see it works. I personally use this function because most of the time you don't need the exact coordinates for the center. Okay, the next property is rotation. Game object dot rotation, and you can set it to math math dot pi, and the object will be rotated. Here, as you, here you can see it was flipped upside down because pi is one one eighty degrees, and pi divided by two is ninety degrees, and so on. That's the pi divided by three, and here it is. Rotation works, but as you can see, the object is not very smooth. Is not smooth right now. So you have to be careful when working with rotation. Or if you want to change how the object is rendered to remove this. To remove this jitterness effect you can do some manual rendering settings. But we'll go over that later. And last basic properties of the game object is has render. You can't set it but you can get it. And has update. If, the ob if you wrote this line, the has render will be set to true, and if you wrote this line, has update will be set to true. And there is also the opposite function. If you have add update, you also have a remove update. Let's write remove update. And if, you if we write remove update, this function will be executed only once, and then it will be deleted, and it will never happen again. Let's remove that. Oh, I'm sorry. Not the game object. We need to remove update from this object. This class is inherited from the game object, so you can also set an image to this class. You can position it on the screen, and so on. But it's not a really good idea to do that, but you still can. And so, as you can see, this line executed only once, and then the update was immediately immediately removed. You can also remove the render from the object. You can write game object dot remove render and it will be no longer visible on the screen. Boom, it's it's gone. And if you want to completely get rid of the object you can just write game object dot destruct and it will remove the render and update for you automatically. Okay, let's make something a little bit more complicated. Let's remove all of that and let's create a new class. Let's call it player and it, it will be inherited from the game object public player let's move all of that here we'll set the name to player let's also add render so that we can see this object on the screen and finally and finally let's create it in our main class player p equals new player and if we launch the application we will be able to see the player on the screen it's not a player it's just a rectangle but it's gonna be fine for this example now let's see what we can overwrite now that we have this new class. Public overwrite and we have a bunch of stuff. We obviously have the update and the render. We can overwrite the frame script that we'll go over a little bit later. This is for the animation. We can overwrite the destruct to so that we can do more more things when we remove in this object. And we can override the standard render. We'll go over we'll go over it a little bit later. Let's remove all of that for a minute and let's talk about input handling. So this fun so this function is called 60 times a second. That means that we can just write if key is down keys dot write and we need to include this library. What is wrong? Right, okay. This key class is the main class for handling inputs we have. There is left click, 
left mouse down, mouse X, mouse Y, right click, uh, right down, and we also have is typed or is down for handling key presses. The difference between the difference between is down and is typed is that when the key is down, it is down every single frame. But when it is typed, it means that we only need to check for a single press. So let's say if the key is down, key right, then let's move the player. X plus plus, and if we launch it, we can hold right and the square moves on the screen. Now let's do the same thing but with typed. If we replace is down with is typed, and, and do key down, y minus, one, one, y minus 10, and if we, that's not what I wanted to do, y plus 10 then. I'm holding the down key right now, but the object only moved once, so if I if I tap the button multiple times, it moves multiple times. But it doesn't do anything if I hold the button. Well, now let's do some animation. Here you can see all the images from this project, some stock images you can say, and we can make an, anim an animation of them. To animate an object we need to do two things. We need to first add images to the object, let's say add image and we can load a new image, images slash x64, and let's give it a name, 64. What it does, this line registers this image by the name 64, so that we can access it in the memory of this object. Let's do a little more, let's do x32, let's rename this to 32, and x, x32, x16, 32, 16. Now, let's just name it 16. Now we need to add some frames. We write add frame and 64. And let's add the frame with the image 32 and the frame with the image 16. What will it These three lines of code will make it so that images 64, 32 and 16 will constantly change between one another. If we launch the project, we will, I'm not sure if it is even possible to see on the video because there might be some problems, but the images are flickering very quickly. If we want to make the frame longer, we just add a comma and set the length. Let's make it half a second, 30 frames. And you can clearly see the result. Every frame is half a second long. If you don't want to use the exact values, you can just write configuration.fps divided by 2. And it's gonna be the same thing. But what if we have something like a sprite sheet and we want to render only a specific portion of the image? Let's say we have this 32 by 16 image and we want to render only half of this image. It will make sense in a while, I promise. Let's add two frames and let's add another parameter U rectangle. And of course, and of course it does that. Let's import this library. And then we just write the region of this of the image that we want to render. We want to render only a 16 by 16 portion of this image. And let's do the same thing for the other half. We want to render this part of an image. That means that we are rendering that means that we are rendering first of all this part and then we are rendering this part. Let's make the image a little bit bigger. Scale like 10, because why not? And here you can see see our animation. This is an example sprite sheet. Of course, these two lines aren't very practical, because why would you want to render a half of an object, but it will make sense if you look at this image. As you can see, there are a lot of frames of a running animation, and you want to render only only this picture, as, and so then you set the render area of this image, then you set the render area of this image, and of this image, and this, 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 and so on. And if you render them very quickly, you can you will be able to see the running animation. And of course, you can put this line inside a, inside a for loop, something like that. And you can write something like i multiplied by 16, and you will be able to render six, uh, 10 images of the same size, 16 by 16 to be exact. Actually, why don't we just do that? Let's let's take this sprite sheet and add it to the game. First of all, we put this image here. Let's rename it anim short. Then we open this content manager. Click on images, add existing item. Uh, excuse me. Oh, I picked the wrong the wrong folder. Let's put it let's put it here and let's click add existing image. Click that and boom, it is here. Now all we need is to re to now all we need is to add this image to this class. And let's remove the name, it will be easier this way. 
Here, this image is 13 by 3 animation frames and it is 9c5 by 133 and 34. And let's add another cycle then. And that should be it. Let's launch it. And you can see all the frames happening very quickly. Let's change that to... Let's change this to 3. And you can see all the frames happening very quickly. Let's make them a little bit slower, like 3 frames. And you can see some portions of the animation. Now let's go over some functions for the animation. Let's remove. Let's remove that and change the button to Q. And let's say if we press Q, we will go to and play frame 0. Basically, when we press the button Q, the animation will go to the first frame and boom. And I'm constantly pressing Q and the animation just resets itself. There is also a go to and stop. It means that the animation will go to the first frame and stop. Let's add, let's add another input handler for the S button and let's say stop. Let's add another input handler for the P button and it will say play. If we press S, the animation stops. If we press P, the animation continues. If we press N, let's do a next frame. It means that the animation will go to the next frame. First of all, let's stop it, and when we press N, the animation goes to the next frame. And you can also do the previous frame, like that. Now let's talk about the, the frame script, the function that we made earlier. When a certain frame happens, we want to do to do something. Like, let's do something something very simple. Let's switch current frame this parameter and if it is frame number 10 let's console the right line 10 and break and you can see 10 and 10 once more and it will just do this every time it hits the 10th frame you can use this as a loop let's say in this image you you arrive at this frame you and you want to loop the running animation then you just say if we are at this frame we want to go back to the first frame and and the same can be done for all the uh, other animation like idling animation walking animation jumping animation and everything you want now let's go over some properties about animation. One of them is stop at the last frame. If you set it to true, then once the animation will hit the last frame, it will stop and it stops at the last frame. It plays and then stop and it's no longer playing. The other things about animation are frames. This is an array of frames and you can interact with the frames if you want. You can say how many frames there are if you want to. You can tell what is the current frame. You can also change this value if you want to, and it will and it will jump the animation to the frame that you've set. There is also is playing variable property, and if the animation is currently playing, it will be set to true. If it is not playing, it will be set to false. There, then there is also the render area, and this is the rec rectangle that that crops the image. You can also set it manually, and I think that is everything that you need to know about animation. Now let's talk about collisions for no particular reason. There is a get rectangle function, short for get rect, haha, lol, and also get absolute rect. It will make sense when I'll explain the layers, but for now you just you don't need to know what's special about this function. The get rect function returns a rectangle. A rectangle is a very basic monogame class that has some math for the rectangle. And every rectangle has an intersects function. If you pass here another rectangle, it will say if the two rectangles collide or not. Very basic collision detection. Now let's talk about the other function that we made, the destruct function. Let's say that we have some other objects in this class, like we have a list. Huh? A list. Let's say we have a list of game objects. And when we want to remove this object from existence, we also want to remove all of the other objects in this list from existence. And we do for each game object in this list. And we write game object dot destruct. And of course you want to keep the base destruct because it also has some important things to handle.
Or let's say if you have some other important things like you have a render target. One thing that is special about render targets it's, is that the garbage collector can't remove them from the memory. You have to you have to help it. You have to say render target dot dispose. If if it is empty, of course, then the the garbage collector can remove it from the memory. And that's how you use the destruct method. And we'll talk about these two functions a little bit later when we when I will touch the layer. When I will talk about the layer and system. For now, let's talk about two other objects. Let's go back to this class and let's create a text field T new text field. Text field is exactly what it sounds like. It is a field of text. Let's write hello world and let's say T add render. And if you launch the application, you will be able to see the oops, something went wrong. Ah, oh, that's strange. I fixed it, and as you can see, there is a hello world in the corner of the screen. You can add, you can you can add different sprite fonts in this content pipeline. You can just add a new text file and edit it so that it represents your font. Nothing complicated. Since the text field is also a game object, you can manipulate the x value, the y value, the scale value, and everything everything you want to manipulate about the text. There is also a color of the text. Let's say color red. There is also... you can set a different sprite font if you want to. You can also... you can also align the text the way you want. Align center. And let's... And let's set T set X Y to mouse so that we can see that it's actually centered. And it is not centered. What the hell is that? I think I've broken something. Huh. I've been I've been messing around with with some classes lately, so so maybe I broken something. Ah, oh, that's better. And as you can see it is aligned by the mouse. Okay, I'll fix this later. Not nothing special. There is also a video game object. It means that it basically can play MP4 files. But I will not touch that right now. I'll just say what it can and can do. Video game object is also a game object. That means that it has the X and Y and everything and everything you need. And it, it, and the only extra thing is the video and the video player. This object also has methods like play, pause, stop. And if you want to manipulate the volume, you can you can go to the video player and go to volume. And if you want to know the current position of the video, you can go to play position. And you can basically play and manipulate video files this way. But this class is not very good because it is very it is very expensive to play a video on the screen because because of the way how mono game works. Because mono game is a cross platform engine, it has some problems for for rendering videos. I mean that it is not a good idea to play very long videos. If you want to play something something short and small and 30 fps or even 15 fps then it is fine to use a game object. But you want but if you want to play an entire movie, trust me your computer will just shut down. It it can't handle this. I've done this before and I'm probably never doing it again. You need to be very careful with Mono Games video engine. Oh and I forgot that we haven't even touched on the configuration file. Before we jump to the layers, the most complicated part of this engine will go over the basic configuration. Here you have your game version. If you if you for some reason need to track that, it would be a good idea to change this value. Here you can set the frames per second. Here is a default project resolution. And he, here are all the other supported resolutions that you allow to use. If you want to make the mouse visible, you type this line. If, if you want to change the background color, color you change this value let's make it pink because why not and the background is pink and now the most complicated part let's go over layers this part is so complicated that i think that i'll have to draw it out for you 
let's draw it some let's draw some kind of a tree here we have our screen and screen has layers here is our default layer and this layer is rendered on the screen our default layer has objects and all of the objects are rendered on top of this layer I mean they are not technically rendered it will make sense in in a minute if you want to control what is in the front of the screen and what is in the back of the screen you can make multiple layers it means that this layer ho has object and this layer has objects let's make only one object here what is even more complicated is that you can nest layers you can say this layer has another layer and this layer has objects in it but also this layer has another layer in it and this layer also has objects in it and it is a very good way to tell the system what objects need to be rendered and in which order Let's say that everything to the right is at the be behind at the behind of the screen and everything to the right is at front of the screen. So this thing is behind and you can see it. It means that the first thing to render on the screen is this object, render this object, then we render this, 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 then we render this, and then we render this and this. And this object is on the top. But that is not all that is good about this system. Let's say you, you want to make this layer stretched this layer has two objects they are a normal size or not and you want to make it so that all of the objects on this layer are stretched so if you take this layer and and stretch it also everything that is on top of this layer is also stretched and even if those two objects were stretched before if you stretch the layer the objects will also the objects will also get stretched even more and if you move the layer all of the objects also move with that layer but that is not even my final form we can go even further beyond we can take this layer and if we stretch this layer it stretches everything even on the nested layers and if you take if you take this layer and I can select the screen we can stretch everything that is on this layer and on the layers inside this layer now that you understand what are layers let's actually write some layers in in the project let's make a new layer layer a new layer Okay, we created a new layer. Now we need to say where this layer is situated. Now that it exists, it is simply a letter somewhere. Not that big. It is simply a letter somewhere. Now we need to tell. Now we need to tell where we assign this layer. Can it be assigned to this layer? Can it be assigned to this layer? Can it be assigned to the screen? And well, to do that, we simply say layer A assign list. And there are currently two lists. Two lists. Then, and there are currently two lists where we can assign this layer. If you, if you go to rendering layer manager, we can see our default layer, and we can see the layers, the list of layers. The default layer, the one where we previously rendered all the objects, is inside this list. But the default layer itself also have, has its own list. That means that we can assign to the layer manager that layers, or we can assign to the layer manager dot default layer dot sub layers. Let's do that. Why not? And now that we have a layer, let's say we want to put an object inside this layer, and we go B set layer layer A. And now this object, this and now this object is inside this layer. Now let's say we don't want to move the object to the mouse position. Let's say we want to move the entire layer to the mouse position. We can go layer render parameters dot x equals key equals key dot mouse x, and we can do the same thing for the y axis. And we can just remove that. And as you can see, we are moving an entire layer with our mouse. And every object that uh, that is on this layer will also move. Let's demonstrate that and create a new object. And just like that, we can create a new object and put it in this layer. And here you see it also moves with the layer. Let's do something a little bit silly. Let ma let's make a lot of objects.
there is a tools class that has some random functions that I didn't know where to put, so I put them there. It has a random function that picks a number between 0 and 100. And there are some other functions that are not really that important. So basically we are creating 10 objects and putting them at random positions. Let's test that and as you can see it works. A bunch of objects. Now let's say we want to stretch this layer like I showed in the example. Let's go layer name, render parameters and there are all of the parameters that you, that you can manipulate. You can set the alpha channel of the entire of the entire layer. You can make the entire level invisible. You can rotate the layer but that is a little bit more complicated than just setting the value. You can stretch the layer and you can change the position of the layer. Let's scale it a little bit. Let's stretch it. And we made it long and thin. Now let's make layers inside of layers. Let's create a new class. Layer nested layer. And let's assign list and we will assign our this layer. Let's make it public static. And we have this layer A and we can just go main dot A dot sublayers and this layer now inside this this layer. Now let's make some objects inside this layer. We can go <laughs> that's silly. X32 and we set layer this. Let's go 1000 and not 10. Let's make a hundred objects. And we can now create this layer. Nested layer B. New layer. And if we launch the program, it doesn't work. Why? Oh, because Because we can do it like that. Because the load function only exists inside the game object. It also exists in the engine, but I haven't implemented it in the layer yet. And I, and I don't think I have to. I don't think it is necessary. So when we launch this application, here you can see exactly what it looks like. It is a layer inside a layer inside a layer. Now let's draw what we have made so that you can understand what just happened. Here is our screen layer. This layer now has the default layer. It's called DL. It is the only root layer. This layer has our player on it. This is our player. And it ho and it also has another it also has it also has another layer inside it. It has a layer. It, it is gonna get very confusing. Player. And this A layer has ten ten different ten different other nameless objects on it and it also has another B layer on top of it that also has a hundred different objects and we, are, and we are changing the render parameters of the A layer. We are scaling it by the, its height. That means that we are taking all of this and we are scaling it like that. Oh, I forgot that we did this. If we remove that now, uh, the player will be set on the default layer and we will not move it if we move all the other layers because we are only moving our custom layer. And if you want to, we can even make two B layers and they will be rendered accordingly. One will be at the bottom and and another one will be higher, except you can't really see the difference right now. Now another very very cool, cool thing. So we have this B layer and it has a hundred objects on top of it. Now let's say we want to make some something very special and we want to apply some visual effects on this 100 objects. What we can do is... Um, so this engine currently has one stock effect written by me. It is a negative effect. It means that it will take an image and invert all of its colors. Let's see if we have that here. Let's let's take this. Let's put it in a new layer. Let's go. So it will make something like that. And it will invert the color of the every single object on this layer. So let's do that. It is a layer. Okay, let's do this with this layer. To do that, we need to first of all say that to multi-render, I will explain what what that means later equals to true and to apply effects also equals to true. Then we overwrite a method apply effects. If you don't need to do base applies effects, there is nothing there. And we can just say first of all we need to create our negative effects. Here is this effect class. We can just say negative effect g equals new negative effect. Let's call it normally effect. Let's make it a public 
no, let's just make it public effects dot apply effect render target container dot render target so it is a little bit complicated to explain what all of that means so every object i mean every layer has a render target con container and it has a render target and this render target has everything that has been rendered on top of this layer. It means that once we call this function, render target will already contain all of these 100 objects. Then what we will do is take that render target and overwrite it and apply a negative effect on top of it. And this function does exactly that. Here we have our effect and it has an apply effect function inside of it. So we take this render target, put it inside this effect and when this function is done it returns a new render target to D and we just take our old render target and overwrite it. You don't need to worry here about uh, memory loss because it handles, it is already handled inside the negative effect file. So let's see if it works. And here you can see all of the squares now uh, black and white instead of white and black. Black and white instead of white and black. So that you can see the difference, remember that we have two the same layers. Let's make it so that, let's remove those two lines and let's only make it so that only B layer has, um, has to apply effects and to multi-render. Now, if, we are, if I've done everything correctly, we will be able to see that only one layer has inverted colors and the other layer don't. And if you write any other custom effects, like this negative effect, you can achieve a lot of very cool cool things. The best, the most basic example, you may, can make a glow effect. You can make it so that the entire layer glows. On you, or you can make an outline effect so that the entire layer has some bold outline around it, around every object, I mean. You can make a shadow effect. You can make some sort of a masking effect. I don't know, the possibilities to truly are endless. You can make a color collect correction effect. It's really is up to you what you want to make with this. And also this negative effect has some special features. It has this effect has a strength value in it and it can be from 1 to 0. Let's make it 0 0.7 and it will make only 70% strong negative effect. As you can see it's not fully negative, it, it only 70% negative. And if you understand how negative effect works if we set it to 0 0.5 it will be exactly gray it is all gray Ex because 50 percent negative effect it is always this gray color now let's say that you want to now let's say that you want to apply uh, this effect but not to the entire layer but to the to a single object here we have these two functions that we've overwritten before they are inside the player class that we've made and we can basically control how the rendering works in this class. Let's go to the let's go to the game object class and I will show you how the default render function looks. Let's go render. Here is how the render function looks. It's very simple if an, if an object is visible and if the layer is visible and its image is not null, then you perform a standard render. And if not, you can just write that it is a null texture. It is not an exception because I I want it to be because it's easier for me and here is the standard render function so basically we don't really need to override the render function we only need to override the standard render but if you want to override this one you still can but you need to worry about implementing this so that it doesn't break so let's copy that and go to our main class to the player class let's remove this render because we don't need it and override this function and here is here is a very familiar function. If you if you know what is mono game, you know what this function does. It basically renders what you need on the screen with the exact parameters that you've set. It renders the image. It renders the uh, how big and where you want it to render. It renders the area of the image. It applies the alpha effect. It rotates the the object around a certain point, it inverts it, orientation if needed, and things like that. So if you want to apply a negative effect on top of it, we first need to do something very complicated. We need to engine sprite batch dot end and we need to engine dot sprite batch dot begin. 
to do the same thing when we are done touch because while we are when we are calling this standard render function the engine has already begun its rendering so we need to pause the rendering start our own rendering and when we are done go back to the rendering that the image was doing before that so let's say we want to apply some negative effect on this game object and we go effect not of course we need to create this effect first effect negative equals new effect we'll go effect equals engine dot content actually let's just steal it from here i don't want to oh here it is and we can say we can also steal that to apply the strength value let's just say one and we just put our negative effect here and it should be done if we start the program we will be able to see that this player model is negative and everything else is not so that means that the engine is very 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 flexible you can apply negative effect to whatever you want you can apply negative effects to entire layers you can apply negative effects to your entire projects not only negative effects whatever you want you can stretch layers squeeze layers rotate layers you can reposition layers you can put layers inside of layers as much as you want and it is very handy I have been trying to make it so that this process of applying effects to single objects would be a lot smoother, but I couldn't figure it out how to make it so that you wouldn't have to do that. Now I want to show you something cool, not um, because the engine somehow renders all of that stuff, if I, and I can show you exactly what it does. If we go to engine and scroll down, down, down here, and say render instructions dot write log, we can see exactly what steps the engine goes through to render all of that, and it lags because the console can't output a lot of things and render at the same time. That's a lot of objects. Actually, let's let's don't draw a hundred objects. Let's draw like ten, and let's draw like five so that it would be easier to understand and here is the start of our rendering i didn't set any names to the layers this is the layer that has x32 image on top of it so first of all it sets the target to that layer and it renders all of the 32 squares it shouldn't be that many okay let's set the name first let's name them b1 and b2 so okay it sets the target to b1 and it starts to render all of these objects on top of b1 i think i forgot to set a smaller number and it renders them exactly on top of that layer because we need to apply a negative effect on top of them then once it's done it applies all the negative effects on top of this layer or generally any effects you you want to set it then it sets the target to screen it draws the player it's hidden uh, here should be apply negative effect to player but it's hidden because we may Manually set it up then we render all of the 64 squares uh, the ones the the brown big ones then we render the layer b1 that has the negative effect on top of it and then we render all of the objects from the layer b2 you might be asking yourself why not render the x32 objects on the layer b2 then because we, we don't need to the system is smart and it knows if there is no reason to render objects on top of a layer it just renders them straight to the most important render target. It it renders uh, these objects on top of layer B1 only because we need to apply the negative effect on top of them. And we set it here to multi-render. It means to render objects on this layer exactly. But if we don't need to multi-render and it is just a layer that only simply modifies some values like stretching and position, then we don't really need to have multiple render targets. We can only render it on the target that it is going to eventually end up on here this is this should be a lot easier to see because i changed some values set render target to b1 render all of the 10 now not 100 10 objects on top of this b1 apply effects on b1 then set this the render target to the screen then render the player then render this file this 10 64 objects on top of it the brown squares then render layer b1 that has effects on top of it and then render all of the other uh, 32 objects that that are on the layer b2 but they don't need to be rendered directly to b2 i hope that makes sense
now that we have uh, now that we have direct render on layer B we can also rotate layer B let's set layer B dot render parameters dot rotation and let's set it to 0 0.1 and this layer will be rotated here you can see it is rotated and it's quite funky to move around actually why it does that I'm not sure I will look into the code because I don't really know if it's supposed to do that I don't know if it is what we just programmed or it's some kind of a bug this layer system is still very fresh and I don't know if what is happening is a bug or it's supposed to do it's supposed to be like that I will look into that uh, when I'll be done with this video and finally the one last thing that this engine has is an audio manager but I really don't want to show this audio manager because of two reasons first of all um, mono game audio is kinda bad the way how it works is very annoying it has a lot of problems with it and and the second problem is that I wrote all of that in in a couple of days I tried to work with this audio engine and it is and it is really bad it, well I sounded the game with it I fully made all of the sounds but it was really really annoying and I think the next step would be to to implement some audio engine that is not a part of mono game even if it means to make the, the entire project not close not cross platform because the audio engine is just bad like one of the most problematic things to me you can you can't set the sound volume anything higher than one or lower than or lower than zero it means that if you want to make a sound louder than than it is you can do that you can only set the volume to 100% you can't go higher and if you like if you want to make a sound really really quiet but still hearable you can do that because if you set a value too low uh, the mono game will just not play the sound it should but it doesn't if the value is too low then there are pro problems like you can't have more than one background tracks playing at the same time because there is only one class that play, that plays background music let's say for some reason you want some two overlapping audio tracks one for the music and one for I don't know something like ambience or or whatever so that means that I'm not going to showcase this class Ex I mean I can still say audio manager dot there's things like audio manager mod it has background music or other it can current song it has a list of current playing sounds so that you can control any sound that is currently playing you can stop it pause it remove it default song song volume and the sound and default sound volume it, you can configure what is the bass volume of any sound or a song that is currently playing not currently just all all the songs and all the sounds can have their default volume you can loop song you can loop sound you can pause song pause sound play and store sound so that you can pause it you can play a random background track, you can play a song, you can resume song, resume sound, single play sound, just play the sound and forget about it. You can uh, start a song but with a slow fade in effect or sl slow stop song is the same but it has a slow, slow volume fade out effect. And, and it has all sorts of different different things but it's still not very comfortable to use because of how mono game handles audio so I'm not going to showcase that and I'd say that this is everything that my engine can do let me quickly go through everything and see if I missed anything audio done well you can go to engine and you can exit you can close application you can set resolution you can go to the input folder to the key class and do something like that you can basically configure what button does what you can say if key down space then jump will be set to true and you can and you can write a lot of other configurable buttons here if you want to then there is a layer manager class you can write your own layers here here is the default layer you can't remove it because all of the objects use the default layer by default and you can write your own layers here if you if you want to but you can also write them in the main class like we did before it doesn't really matter where you put them the most important part is how you configure them and I think that's about it that's everything that my engine can do 
I'm gonna I'm going to remind you please let me know what you think about this engine in the comments because I really because I really want to know if I'm missing something very important that the engine should do but my engine doesn't if you learned something from this video it is also very great and yeah please let me know what you think about it you can write here in the comments or you can tag me in mono game discord community I hang I hang around there pretty often I'm basically online most of the time and if you want to talk I'm I'm there and the last part of this video I would like to say that this engine is tested and it has been tested a lot the only thing that isn't tested is the new layer system I have been using this engine for around uh, two years and I've been making a game with it called 7 reboot it is possible that one day this game will be released to Steam maybe and I've been it takes a very long time to make a game. So what I'm trying to say is that this engine is comfortable to use and I've used it to make a game and I've made a game using it. That means that it's not at least garbage, I mean it's usable, you can work with it. And now that I've shown you everything there is to see in this engine, I would like to show you some parts of the game that I find pretty interesting to look at. Some impressive, cool looking things. I mean not really impressive, but they are a practical showcase of the engine. Showcase of if you watch if you watch this video up until this point congratulations and thank you a lot it really means a lot to me now i will show you some of the cool things that exist in my game thanks for sticking around and enjoy the rest of the showcase Thanks for watching.